Okay, so that's a basic explanation of how some uh, simple assembly works. We can make this a little bit more complicated. So what, you know, we've only been looking at the main function just now. What I wanna do is just introduce another function um, and then we can kind of see how some of those interactions happen at a function level because that's kind of interesting. And then you'll, you know, and it's, it's a basic jump from what we've been uh, doing already. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new uh, function called sum and then I'm gonna have num1 and it's gonna be of i32 and num2 of uh, i32. And then what I'm gonna do is return an i32 as well. And then what we will do here is we'll just do let result equals num1 multiplied by uh, num2. And then I'm gonna return this as result multiplied by uh, num1. Now, in this particular case, rather than using the return statement, I'm just going to use the uh, last statement that, that is executed on the function is what's going to be returned, and we'll see how that looks. So it works exactly in the same way as a return statement, but, but I think it's just fun to kind of show that. So what we'll now do is we'll still have uh, num1 and num2 set to 10. I think I'm going to simplify this a little bit, so we'll just do let result... Uh, equals sum of uh, num1 and num2, and then we'll just print the result. So the value of result is uh, result. So we will save that for a second. I'm gonna bring back my terminal. We'll just do a cargo run, just make sure it all works. And it says the value of the result is 2000. So let's do that calculation for a second. So num1 is 10, num2 is 20. So that's 10 and 20. We're gonna pass 10 and 20 through here. So that is 10 multiplied by 20. That's gonna be sorting out results, so that's 200. And then the 200 is gonna be multiplied by the first number, which is 10, which is 2000. That's gonna be stored out to this result and then it's gonna be printed out. So let's take this and then I'm gonna copy that back into uh, Godbolt. Again, you could you could use the uh, Cargo ASM tool, um, but I think it's kind of fun to use the Godbot tool uh, in general. So we've now done this. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna look for uh, our example main. The reason I'm looking at main first is gonna become apparent in a second because if I come back up the way and I look at sum, first thing I want you to see is in the sum function, which is up here, you've got this sub RSP24. So it's saying I want to be 24 bytes. I want 24 bytes allocated uh, from, from the stack pointer. So, okay, so I'm going to have a little area from the stack pointer uh, underneath, which is going to store um, my function which is fine. And by the way, by, by looking at this code, you're starting to get an idea of how code and data is allocated, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you can kind of see that when we're allocating data or we're starting from the function perspective, you know, it's, it's allocating 24 bytes, it's, you know, it's subtracting it from the, where the stat pointer is. And then what you've got here is is when I'm I'm copying data, then it's sort of above the stack pointer. So, you know, it's really sort of interesting stuff. Function code here, data up here, yep. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, first thing, and this is this is why I want to point this out. So when I look at example sum, the first thing that I'm doing is I'm moving the value on the, in the register EDI into RSP plus 16, right? So I'm moving this into this memory piece, 16 bytes uh, after the, the the start pointer. But I don't know what the value EDI is at this point. I haven't got a clue, right? What's in virtual register EDI? There's nothing coming in here. And that's why I wanna come back down into at main for a second, because actually what you're now seeing, so next thing is main is RSP88. So, you know, subtract 88. So you can, you can again, back to my point, that, the, you know, here is uh, 24 bytes down is, is uh, uh, is oh, I've got 24 bytes for um, for my first function sum, and then I've got 88 for for main. So you're sort of building up this this kind of stack here. But but look here. So the first line in main is move 10 into virtual register 
uh, EDI, and then move 20 into virtual register ESI. So EDI has 10, ESI has got 20. And then what it's doing is calling um, my sum function. So you can see it's just doing call and then it's given the location there. Um, and then it, it's, it's going to go off and undo that. That in itself is interesting. So as soon as it goes and calls um, my, my new sum function, let's move up here, back up to sum. You can see it's now sharing virtual registers. So you see that EDI, even though I've set it down here, <laughs> it's being used up here. And this is compiler magic, right? So it's just going, well, I know the value is in EDI, I'm just going to use it, right? And and that's and that's because it can do that with with compilation. So I again just something I want you to kind of be aware of because we talk about things like scope etc quite a quite a bit and we'll, we'll look at scope in a second but essentially I've I've set num equal to 10 here and num at 2 equal to 20 here down here in this function but in this function over here yeah which is completely different scope etc but actually um, what's actually happening underneath the hood is the assembly is the same. I'm still storing, I'm getting my 10 and 20 from the same virtual registers, EDI and ESI in the sum function, as I'm setting them in the main function. And again, it's it's kind of perfectly safe to do that. The compiler knows what it's doing, it knows how to emit things. These are immutable, they can't be changed, etc. Nobody can access that data because it's it's kept to to within the point of the sec. So it's it's it, it might look a little bit whoa, but actually it's it's kind of really safe there. So let's come back to this for a second. <laughs> So you can kind of see what's going on. So it's taking uh, it's taking the value of EDI, you know, the EDI, and it's just going to store that in uh, in RSP plus sixteen. So a little bit of safety. It's just going to stick it in there for a second. So twenty four down, and then it's you know uh, it's got uh, sixteen in there. So it's using four bytes for that, which is cool. It's going to do its 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 multiplication ESI multiplied by what's in EDI. We know that's ten and twenty, so uh, it's going to do that calculation and then store the result in EDI. So EDI in this particular case is now going to have the value two hundred, and then what it's going to do is store two hundred at the top of the stack. Again, just think about this for a second. It's allocated twenty four bytes. Yeah. What it's done there, we know that the, the result here is going to be four bytes, so RSP plus 20. Then it's going to add, it's going to take that four bytes and it's going to store the result. So it's going to be <laughs> essentially at 200 at the top there, and then slightly below there is, is the, the earlier value, which has got the value of EDI at 16. So in that particular case, uh, if I remember EDI was set to 10, you know, if you think about the stack for a second, it's going to have 200 here, you know, essentially between 20 and 24, and then uh, it's going to have 10 between 16 and, and 20. So that's kind of what, what's happening there. It's going to do, once it's done its multiplication, uh, it's going to store that value, as I said, and then what it's going to do is just test for overflow. We've seen that again, and then if we've got an overflow, it's, it's going to do a jump again, uh, and then do all the panicking stuff, and we're not going to uh, we're not going to uh, uh, see that. Okay, so next thing, once it's done its overflow check, the next line here is is going to do a calculation, which is going to take the result, which is remember is two hundred, and then it's going to multiply that against num one. This is where it starts to get really cool, right? Because we know that the value ten, which is num one, is stored in RSP plus sixteen. So what it's going to do there is going to take the 10, which is stored in RSP plus 16, and it's going to move it into the virtual register ESX. And then it's going to take the value 200, which we know is stored in memory location RSP plus 20, and then it's going to store that in virtual register EAX. And then it's going to do multiplications. So ECX multiplied by EAX, and then the result is going to be stored in EAX. So in this case, ECX, which is equal to 10, is going to be multiplied by EAX, which is 20, and the result is going to be 200, and that's going to be stored in virtual register EAX. And because 200 is a 
and you know, again, four bytes again, it's gonna store that in RSP plus 12. So now we've got 20, uh, you know, so remember it's 24 bytes, RSP plus 20, which has got 200, and then RSP 16 has got uh, 10, and then underneath that now, uh, the result of virtual register EAX, which is gonna have 200 and that's stored there. And again, it's gonna do an overflow check, if there's a, a you know an overflow of some sort, it's going to jump to four, and then otherwise it's going to jump off to label three. Last thing it's going to do. Remember, I said whatever is the last thing in the stack is going to be uh, essentially what is returned from the function. That's actually what's got to happen now. Is is it needs to make that value that that two hundred available for return. So all it's going to do is take the value plus 12, the uh, 200, and it's going to shove that in virtual register EAX so it can be accessed a little bit later on. Um, and that's going to be returned from the stack. And then eventually what you're going to see here is add 24 onto RSP. We know RSP is of size 24 bytes. So it's essentially adding 24 bytes onto uh, RSP again. And then that essentially means we're off of the stack and we can sort of continue back to where we left off. So we're back into um, essentially main. So <laughs> we've called some which is cool. And then it's going to do a whole bunch of other stuff down here. We're not going to get that into too much details. Um, but but essentially, uh, eventually it's going to do that print. Uh, and that is going to be the value. The result is blah, blah. So again, it starts to give you this idea of how things are sort of building up. Now, if I wanted to, I could increase these values. So I could turn this into I64, I64, and I64. And when I do that, one of the things I want you to notice is when I start working with the stack, I'm no longer working with, remember it was RSP plus four and then RSP plus four again. You can now see that I'm working with eight bytes each time, right? So the, the game has changed. I need more memory allocation uh, to do those calculations. So that is one of the things to kind of be very much aware of with Rust is the calculations, the size of your variables need to be known in advance. And therefore you can probably understand if I try and mix I32s and I64s, then it's gonna have to do some calculations, et cetera, to do that, to, to, be, able, to be able to uh, get the type sizes correct. Because Rust underneath the hood is calculating the exact sizes of everything it needs. So, so far, we've been dealing with kind of immutables. Uh, let's bring this back to I32. What happens when we're dealing with things like mutations? Well, let's let's kind of mess around with that and see what happens. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna make uh, num1 a mutation. I'm gonna make num2 a mutation. Maybe what I will do is I will set num1 equals 20, and then I will set num2 equals 30 and then we'll put let result equals some num1 uh, num2 and then we'll set that to let result 2 and then let's see actually uh, and we'll just print out the value of result 2 as well so we've changed the calculation quite a bit. Let's see what's actually happening under the hood. So let's come back to our uh, main function. Key thing I want us to, to, to understand for a second. So you can see I've moved everything back to 32-bit integers. So we're dealing with kind of four bytes uh, for storing the data on the stack. Big thing I want you to see there is not a lot has changed here, right? So even though I've set num1 to be mutatable, which is which is fine, I can change the value, I'm still doing the EDIs and ESIs. You can kind of see 10 and 20s moving in there. It's still storing those values for later on. There, there isn't a kind of a lot of change. When I call sum, for example, so if we come up to sum for a second, big thing I want you to see, even though it's kind of mutated there, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's still sharing EDI and ESI, right? So it it, it knows that's the right uh, virtual registers it wants to work with. The code there is the same. It's not making any differences, um, you know, to 
that that piece of code. So you know, it's not a big change there. It's it does the sum, and then here again, it's still reusing uh, virtual registers. So here, num one is now equal to twenty. Note that it's still using EDI. It's still putting twenty into EDI. It's still putting thirty into ESI. So as far as the assembly code is concerned, it doesn't matter, right? It's the compiler that's sort of uh, managing and, and maintaining this uh, for us. And then when we do the sum, it's obviously all it's going to do is, is call the same sum function as, as we did before. And that sum function is going to continue to work because it's using EDI and ESI from as, as it did on the first call. So as long as it's maintaining the use of those virtual registers, that's, that's fine. So from that perspective, there isn't, there isn't a lot of changes on the fact that, that we're sort of using uh, mutations. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, okay, but you haven't made uh, the sum function mutatable. What if you make a, a change there? So let, let's do that. And then what we'll maybe do is change the value of num1 and we'll set that equal to num2 times 2. Yeah. And we won't change anything else within there. And then maybe what I'm going to do here is I'll do a num1 plus uh, 20. And then we'll set and we'll leave num2 to 30. I think that's going to be fine. Um, and then let's have a look at what goes on. Now, if I was to copy that in, in a second, because it's probably quite complicated that, Let's save that here. Let's do a cargo run for a second before we look at the assembly. Uh, we'll just do a cargo run. And you can see it's come up with this fairly large value, 54,000. And I'm not going to do the math because the, there's little point. All I really want you to see is that I'm sort of changing values, moving it around, and, and, it, and it continues to work. But let's come back into uh, our assembly for a second. So we'll come back into the main function. And again, it's not going to look that different, right? So if we look here, we're, we're still sort of allocating kind of memory space and moving 10 and 20 into 28 and 32 memory locations. That's probably the big difference is what we're doing now is we're starting to store those values, uh, you know, for, for later reuse. So we've got 10 and 20 now moving into memory locations, so I can access them a little bit later if I need to. I've got 10 and 20 moving into uh, my uh, virtual registers, EDI and ESI, and then making my call. And that's that's really the the, the big change that, that that's occurring there, because if you think about it, you know um, I don't want to lose that on the mutation. So I, I you know so it's just saying okay, I know that there is a possibility these values are going to get edited and, and modified, and that's fine. But but just be aware, I'm going to keep you a copy of that just just in case. Right. So now we're going to come into the sum. Um, so if we come into sum for a second. Same th sort of thing. It's taking a copy of EDI and, and ESI, it's storing it in, in, in its stack. That's fine. It's doing the calculations, uh, you know, the uh, ESI multiplied by whatever is in uh, location 20. Um, it's doing its, its, its checks again. It's doing the second multipl multiplication, and then it's sort of jumping out there. So even though it's kind of running a mutation at this point, it, it doesn't really matter because it's still using virtual register reuse. It's just been a little bit more cave, careful in storing the copies. So as you can see, that's kind of how mutations work. It works exactly in the same way as immutables, but essentially all that's really happening underneath the hood is just using more stack memory locations to store the values so that it can access it later on. But essentially, it's still using all the same virtual registers. It's still using all the same calculations uh, as it was before. But the key thing is it's still using all of those fixed widths. Now, so far we've been playing around with with uh, integers quite a bit. Um, I'm just going to bring this back to kind of being a little bit simpler for a second. So let's just uh, turn that back to uh, let result equals sum of num1 plus num2. And then well, let's just do a return of sum1 multiplied by, uh, sorry, num1 multiplied by uh, num2. 
and then we'll just get rid of this mutation here. So we are gonna have 10 multiplied by 20, and then it's back to being a very, very kind of uh, simple uh, sum for a second. So if we look at the uh, sum here, we're again back to four bytes, but again, um, one of the things that we could do in this particular case is you've seen that when I make this modification, the you know if I put it to I64, it becomes uh, uh, eight bytes. Again, if I put this down to something like I16, let's just do that for a second, I16, and then we come back to sum for a second, you're gonna see that the, you know, rather than them being a four bytes, it's, it's gonna bring this down to two bytes. Okay, so rather than doing an I32, let's change this to an F64. So we'll use a float. Uh, we'll just change that here, here, and here. And we'll just add uh, a dot zero here, just so it's a nice floaty number. And then if I come back down to where my uh, sum is for a second, what you can see, it's slightly different, the code for when I'm using floats. Um, if I look at the sums here, you can see I'm using mol SD. So, you know, you can see it's using multiplication, double pre precision. So it's using a slightly different sort of, uh, you know, uh, assembly operand there, which is fine. You can see it's using XMM0. So it's sort of changed the, the register that it's using. Um, but but it kind of the the key thing is there the it's it's again it's it's using different kind of pointer sizes for for storing things in and out of the stack. So you know that that's fine. But the key thing is it's it's still fixed width. Okay, last thing I'm probably going to do is I'm going to create a mad little function, right? So if you can see here, I what I'm doing is setting num one equal to ten, number two equals to twenty. I'm going to calculate a result num one multiplied mod by num2 plus num1, and then I'm gonna do a Boolean calculation. If this result is less than num2 multiplied by 63 num2, I'm gonna set that as low. And then if it's low, or if it's uh, num1 is greater than three 400, then we're gonna print true, otherwise we'll print false. So it's a nonsense piece of code, um, but it's a nonsense piece of code for a reason, right? So if I do a cargo run for a second, you see it comes back with true. But if I were to copy this nonsense piece of code into uh, Godbolt for a second, and then we have a look at the code, I'm not gonna run through it too heavily because we've we've explained most of this code already. You know, so if you start at the top there, you know, you can, you can start to see already it's gonna start trying to make some uh, some uh, some fairly quick optimizations. So you see, it's moving 200 into EAX. The reason it's doing that is 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 it knows that 10 multiplied by 20 uh, is uh, num1 multiplied by num2. So it's done a it's done a few optimizations in the compiler already. It's added 10 to that, so it's given us the value 210. So there's there's a quick optimization that it's done, and then it's going to store that value in uh, EAX for a little bit later on. It's going to do its over, uh, overflow check. Next thing it's going to do is it's going to move 20 uh, into EAX. It's going to move 63 into EAX. So that 20 is from num2 uh, into ECX, sorry. And then it's going to do a calculation. So it's going to do ECX multiplied by uh, EAX and store the results. So it's in the middle of sort of doing this calculation here. And then what it's gonna do is store that result in RSP plus 12 and then do its overflow check. If it's uh, if it fails, it's gonna do its panic and it's gonna move down to here uh, at label four, so it's gonna do its jump. Uh, and if everything's successful, it's gonna jump into uh, uh, L3 here. Now, this is where I wanna sort of uh, pick up what's going on here. So the first thing that it's then doing is it's, it's taking the value we previously calculated, put it in EAX, it's taking that 20 and num2, and then it's putting it into ECX, it's doing the multiplication again. So more calculations that's going on over here, it's doing its overflow check. If it fails the overflow, it goes to six, otherwise it goes to five, so we're gonna pick up at five. This is where I wanna jump in at this point. So the first thing that you can kind of see here is it's moving whatever is an RSP16 into EAX, fine. It's, uh, it's moving whatever is into RSP plus eight into ECX, and then it's doing a compare. 
And that is the if statement. So that's that's a kind of nice thing that you can kind of see there, right? So there's your if statement. So if EAX and EACX are the, the same, then what it's going to do is, is do a jump. So there's two conditions, uh, eight and seven. So as you can kind of see, uh, if, if if I jump to eight, it's doing a sort of uh, a nice little move with uh, some byte pointers here. Uh, and then if I do, if I move to seven, then it's uh, doing to doing a jump to, to label uh, sort of nine. Uh, label nine, uh, as as you can probably gather, uh, more complicated stuff, but essentially is 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 essentially going to be doing my print statement. So why am I pointing that out? I'm pointing that out is the you know if if you're going to do if statements, you can see that's perform with the the compare and then the jump statements. Uh, and again, there's other ones like that. You can put in while loops and then you're gonna see the various loop statements going on in here as well. Okay, so that's been a bit of an intense video, but hopefully you now understand how Rust and Assembly works underneath the hood. You can take your code, the Rust code that you're creating, and then you can generate the underlying assembly and, and understand how that truly works. We now have a pretty deep understanding of the stack and we understand the importance of the stack and fixed length variables. We've looked at things like integers and floats and bulls and cars, all of the primitive types work on the stack. And you now understand how that memory is allocated. And you actually understand how virtual registers work and how it's doing those calculations and how that data is stored within the stack for future retrievals. So you see the virtual registers can be shared between multiple functions. You get the idea that scope doesn't really kind of count. What's actually happening is the compiler is doing some magic with the virtual registers and memory locations to make that work. So it's all pretty cool stuff. We've looked at the if statements, how that's implemented with things like compares. We've actually looked at loops as well, right? And we now understand when we look at loops, then really it's just go-to statements. It's just jump statements with compares as well. So again, underneath the hood, you're getting a lot of jumps. There's no concept of loops underneath there, right? So when we look at while loops or loops or you know any of that, then it's really syntactic sugar of the language. And again, although we haven't looked at things like scopes, you could probably guess what's going to happen underneath the hood with a compiler. It's going to do some magic with memory locations. It's going to do some magic with virtual registers, and then it's going to move that around. So we're all in a pretty good state, and we've seen the same with things like mutations. So Rust is doing a lot to handle that memory management uh, underneath the hood. Now, I recognize we haven't done anything with the heap at this point, and that's okay, right? We are going to go into the heap in more detail later. But you've got an idea of how that works, all right? And we haven't looked at things like pointers. I will do a future video where we're going to do things like ownership and borrowing, where things like the heap is going to be kind of key. But I think you get the idea that the heap is a slower piece of memory, right? In the same way as we have to sort of store off uh, memory, you know, um, you know, even even though it's in the stack, we have to have pointer locations to memory locations to use that. It's kind of like the heap, right? The, the memory allocation is just a big blob of data with memory locations. You need to go and look it up, allocate the memory, get the data, bring it back. We'll cover that in another video, right? But um, but you can get that the heap is going to be much slower, and that's key to, to borrowing and ownership when we cover that in another video. The other thing that I kind of want you to recognize is that in strong typing, right, that's why primitives are on the stack. We have to know the size of the variables. It's all calculated by the compiler. That's why dynamic languages like JavaScript, Python, etc., they all work with the heap. They can't work with the stack. You can only work with the stack when you know the size of the variable in advance, right? Or it can't change. Well, that doesn't work in this case with Rust, right? I need to know the size of my variable. I need to know the type. Because if I don't know the type and I can change the type, then I can get into memory problems, which Rust is preventing you. And that's why the compiler won't let you do things like um, put a flow into an integer. It's going to go, whoa, I'm allocating, you know, uh, four, four bytes of data or eight bytes of data, depending. And you've got this blooming great big float thing. You can't stick that in there. It's a different type. And that's why things like type coercion and you could lose values, you might not lose values, depending on what you're doing. Um, but, you know, it allows you to move these things together. Hopefully you get the understanding. We never covered it in this video, but things like fix with the arrays, Fixed width arrays can live on the stack because we know the size. So therefore, if we know the size, it can be on the stack. But if I've got something that isn't known in size, so if it's uh, 
an array with no fixed width, if it's um, you know something like a string which can change the size, then, then it can't live on the stack because it's not a fixed size. So something like a string will then live uh, in the heap. And we'll cover this with, again, with ownership and borrowing and some of the other videos when we cover memory management. But that's why when you start to see things like string from with the literals, and then we're bringing it out into the string, you know, and then you're looking at things like slices, etc. That's why, um, that's why heap management and all that becomes important and why you've got different operators within the Rust language to handle it because you've got this switch between the stack and heap all the time. Again, we'll cover that in another video. Um, that's not really the sort of purpose of this video, but hopefully on this video, you'll have got an understanding of how Rust compiles down into assembly, a little bit of understanding of how assembly works and how you can use that yourself and start to understand the code that you generate and so that you can then uh, um, start to get a deeper understanding of the language. Now, last thing that I wanna say is obviously, one of the things that I've done here is I've been using debug, right? And rather than release, when you release code and when you do the, a release build, all of these debug symbols and plus further optimizations are going to happen because the compiler is going to start to get really smart and say, hey, this is dead code. This is, you know, a hot loop. It's going to do lots and lots of things to make your code much faster uh, underneath the hood. But again, it's just to give you an idea of, of kind of how that works. So, it, you know, how your code ends up being executed is slightly different from what I'm showing here because of the optimizations. But anyway, I hope this is giving you a bit of a deeper understanding of Rust and how you can then... Uh, and how it converts to assembly and then how you can take your own code and then turn it into assembly and understand what's happening under the hood. And that sort of demystifies the language a little bit. Anyway, uh, hopefully we'll see you soon in the next video.